we're also going to be recording too. So, and then that's going to be posted on our website that I just put in the chat. So if you haven't done so already, please mute yourself if you are not one of our panelists. And we will provide um, this town hall, virtual town hall meeting for Columbia and Greene counties um, on our Facebook page as well as on our website so you can access some information that you might have missed um, during the event. So I hope that all of us have some good connections here and we'll kind of get to it. Um, so I'm going to welcome you all again. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we do have amazing panelists here from Columbia and Greene County here to talk to you and provide you some information in regards to addiction services, whether it's for treatment, prevention, and recovery. And it's extremely important as a community member in Columbia and Greene Counties to know what services are available to you and your families, um, rather than, oh, we should have this, we should have had that type of thing. So. This is why this virtual town hall meeting is so important because it gives you this opportunity to ask your own questions and to get those answers that you need and to share this information along with other community members and family members um, that would really need this information. So again, my name is Tatiana Jerji. I'm the program coordinator of the Northeastern Community Action Partnership. And we are partners with multiple uh, facilities and organizations and community members and people in all of the capital district, providing you with resources for addiction services. And um, our panelists today is Carl Quinn from uh, Greener Pathways. Also from Greener Pathways is Robert Hoyt. Uh, Tracy Quinn, which is uh, for a law enforcement from Green County Sheriff's Department. So Captain Tracy Quinn and Mary Minahan, who is a senior substance use, substance abuse prevention um, educator and director at Catholic Charities in Columbia, Greene County. So thank you all so much for joining us in this panel. Um, so I would love to have you introduce yourselves, if that's okay. As I said to the audience, we already have your full bios on our, on our website in the event section, so people can learn more about you. But I would love for you to introduce yourself with your own voice and to um, introduce yourself to Facebook Live and all of us here joining on Zoom. So um, Carl Quinn, can you in introduce yourself for us? Sure, thank you for every, everybody to uh, join in on the call. So I'm Carl Quinn, I'm the program director of the Greener Pathways Mobile Outreach Program at Twin County Recovery Services, and I'm a certified recovery peer advocate family. Great, thank you so much, Carl. Robert Hoyt. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Uh, my name is Robert Hoyt, I am a certified Recovery Peer Advocate with Greener Pathways, which is the mobile outreach uh, arm, I'll say, of Twin Counties Recovery Service. Um, and I'm glad everybody's here. This is this is exciting. It's my first time doing this. Uh, I was honored when uh, I was asked to join the panel. Um, and today is a good day to be sheltering in place. So I hope everybody's doing well. Exactly. Thank you, Robert. Kai Hillman. Ah, hello. <laughs> I'm Kai Hillman. I'm currently the program director of the Youth Clubhouses of Columbia Green Counties through the Mental Health Association of Columbia Green. Um, and I'm a person in recovery and a family member of people in recovery and still struggling. I always add that in. Um, and I forgot what else I wanted to say, but maybe I'll get to it later. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. And Thank you. Captain Tracy Quinn. Hi, can everybody hear me? Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? You're a little, you're cutting out a little bit. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me now? Are you there? Yes, Hello? now I can hear you. Perfect. How about now? <laughs> Are you there? 
Yes. I'm, I'm currently home with my six children while my husband works. So I'm, I'm trying to make it work. Um, can everybody hear me now, yes. do you think? Okay, good. Thank you so um, much. So I got involved in this, obviously I've been at the sheriff's office for 16 years. Oh, I think we, I think we lost her on the call. Um, okay, so hopefully she'll get back on and continue that, how she's been in the green, uh, Okay, so um, sorry about that. She should be back on shortly, I hope. Um, but we can just move on for right now. Um, we have uh, Mary Minahan. Would you like to introduce Hi. yourself? Yeah. Hi, I'm Mary Minahan, and I am one of the mission um, educators, prevention coordinators at Catholic Charities of Columbia and Green Counties. Kelly West is my colleague. She and I are the, um, we work together in the schools in Columbia County, typically grades K through 12. We work with them, and our goal is to educate and assist the students to build positive, positive character traits and help them make healthy choices and good decisions as children and adults. Awesome, thank you, Mary. And I think um, Tracy came back on. Yeah, hi, am I back, am I in now? Yeah, you sound great, thank you. Okay, I had a call in. I'm, I'm home with my six kids because my husband's working and we have no internet here. So um, everybody can hear me now, I hope, Tatiana? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I got involved in this um, because my one of my siblings is um, a drug addict who's been struggling for many years uh, in and out of rehab, um, and uh, it's been really hard on my family. And I, I kind of think a lot of people uh, look at you know maybe law enforcement or or just professionals in general and think they don't have those types of issues in their families or you know even with themselves. And um, I like to let people know that um, you know it reaches all aspects of everybody's life. And, you know, addiction has definitely touched pretty much everybody that I've ever met in some way or another. Um, so it's really close to my heart. Um, and I tried to do what I can with the position that I have to have a positive effect on it in at least Green County. Thank you so much, Tracy. And many of us can relate to having someone that we know who's struggling with substance use disorder, um, whether it's someone in our family, someone that we work with, ourselves. Uh, it's extremely important to have that open mind, to know that we are constantly, there's a road ahead of us, and we are constantly able to grow and evolve um, from those struggles and demons that we might face. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to mm -hmm. start off the panelists with, um, our, my own question that our colleagues, so Kneecap and I um, partnered up in, in wanting to know. So based on your bios, based on your personal impact with addiction and substance use disorder, um, can all of the panelists, I'll uh, call your name at the time, but can all, the, all of you um, tell us how your personal experience impacts your career choices you have made? And you know, the work that you do every day. Um, so C Carl, can you start us off with that? Sure, absolutely. So um, my unique situation is that I'm probably in a, in a completely different place, 180 degrees from where I was four or five years ago. Um, it started particularly for our family. I, I have two sons uh, who have battled addiction for a long time. And then, you know, so my prior life, my wife and I owned a computer business. We, uh, for the last 20 years, we've had a technology business doing computer repair, website design, anything technology related. Um, and then along came both of our sons battling addiction, uh, trying to in and out of treatment and finding things that worked and didn't work, taking them to places and being told they weren't sick enough to go home and come back when they were sicker. And, you know, so so that started the turn for both my wife and I. My wife sooner than than me, 
And um, so we really have participated in the education, training, anything we could do to learn more about substance use and, and how we could help our children, but also help other people, uh, you know, in our community. Both Lori and I have been actively involved in our community for many years through different groups and organizations. So we knew people who were battling the same things. So the conversation started, uh, you know, about what can we do as a community to try and make sure that somebody else's kids don't go through the same thing our, our kids have gone through. So that was my impetus to become a peer advocate, learn more about it, learn what I could do to help my both of my boys and and help other people at the same time. Uh, I, I am, like I said, 180 degrees from where I was a couple of years ago. I was the parent who would sign a pipe and put it in a Ziploc bag and throw it in the garbage, uh, you know, and say, you can't live here. You have to you have to do other things. I, I now, you know, knowing what I know now, I, I would not be that way four or five years ago. Uh, unfortunately, it's what I knew at the time. And um, so part of what I do through my job now is to try and educate people, advocate for people, and make sure that that same type of scenario doesn't happen to somebody else's kids that happened to mine. Wow. That's really the strength that you have you know, to hold the family together and also bring that experience to help the community. It's, wow. It's Thank been you. a, a huge learning curve, but, you know, and not without support of, of, of both, uh, you, both of my boys and, and my wife, as well as our extended family, uh, have been very supportive through the whole thing. And, and that's encouraging. That's what, you know, that's what a lot of families are lacking is, is that familiar support system that, that can back things up when it happens. So, I'm, I'm glad I have that. I'm lucky to have that in my life. Thank you for sharing that. Sure, thank you. Tracy, would you like to share your own uh, personal, you, sh you know, started off expressing um, that you have a family member who suffers from substance use disorder. And so how does that affect you with your day-to-day -day work in law enforcement? Uh, just making sure you guys can hear me since I'm on my phone, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, I was already on the job i got on the job when i was 20 and my it's my younger brother who's quite a bit younger than me um so when he really got into the the throes of it i was already a road patrol deputy um and what i found was i didn't have all the answers for things that that my parents needed and you know i always felt like i i should have been able to direct them more to give them more help um you know to really come in and be the person that fixed him uh, or at least, you know, went and brought him to the place um, to get him help. And it was, uh, it was eye opening, like Carl said, that it, it's really not clearly defined. Um, you know, we went through a lot of different things to try to get him um, the care that he needed, finally did. Um, but it's been a roller coaster, like I'm sure a lot of people can attest to, Kai can attest to that it goes up and down. Um, he's been clean, then he's relapsed, clean, relapsed. Um, just recently relapsed onto meth, which was a real, a real uh, struggle for us. Um, but he's currently just got out of a halfway house and is back with his wife and child and, and doing really well um, for now. But we, we hold out hope. But um, what I took from it was, I think that the family needed a lot more support and there needed to be people to reach out and say, these are the people that can help you. This is what we can do for you. So what we've recently done at the sheriff's office was we um, instituted the ICP program, which is the Impacted Citizens Program. We didn't want to limit it to just people who were um, struggling with drug addiction, but that's mainly what we focus on. Um, and we've so far been able to help approximately 85% of people with setting them up, with, with getting them to agree to services and setting them up with services, and they're still involved with receiving services. And services can be anything from a uh, counselor to um, going to rehab, which Ulster County has been helping us get them to rehab and MCAT has been a huge partner and so has um, uh, Carl and his team. So I tried with things like that, with implementing that and not just helping that person who overdosed, but also offering services to the family because I found that my parents really could have used a lot more handholding and I couldn't find anybody to help them. A lot of the places that my brother went to said that they offered 
family therapy and but they really never did uh didn't matter how many times i called or said you know when is my family going to come out and really learn how to live with an addict and parent an addict and i never got a call back um so i you know that was it was frustrating but i do what i can with with what i have to to try to help that um we also have um we're sending somebody to the dare keeping it real school and that's being sponsored by the rural health network uh in january they only do that one time a year um so i feel strongly that a lot of addiction can be curbed with some sort of attempt at um just not starting it in the first place i find like rehab is a lot harder than prevention so we're really trying to focus on the prevention aspect of it and really um you know educating the kids on better choices and if we don't have that education out there how will they know you know what the right path is and the wrong path and a lot of parents themselves are struggling so that's what the kids see um, so we want to kind of open some doors for them um, we're also hoping that the icp group program can help us with our new um, we're going to have a new jail built soon which is going to have a lot more room to offer services within uh, and while the person's incarcerated such as starting like a mat you know the medicated assistant treatment or um, you know some type of services that can help with fighting relapse and recidivism so you know, that's what i'm doing with uh with my position and and trying to combat the uh, opioid epidemic all of that on top of covid on top of the big family that you have kudos to you <laughs> kai would you like to join in on how does your impact of addiction uh, your personal uh experiences you know how does that impact your day-to-day -day work yeah, sure. Um, I guess uh, I, I actually got into the field of addiction recovery by accident or maybe not. Um, never an accident. I was actually current. I was I was still using um, when I was I became a resident counselor in in Albany to an adolescent rehab. Um, what an amazing experience, though, because um, you know, I guess I was, seeds were being planted and I didn't even know it. Um, and, you know, years later, um, I, I finally got a DWI and finally like, was like, okay, all right, I hear you. I hear everybody. Um, and, you know, it changed my life. Um, and at the time I was also, my mom had passed away and I had guardianship of my younger sister who was 14, around 14 at the time. Oh, that was an amazing experience. <laughs> we could joke about it now. Um, it was a struggle. Um, like Carl, you know, I, I can relate to Carl um, and others in terms of, you know, well, I was, I was in, you know, in addiction and then becoming clean and then a guardian of someone who is entering addiction. And, you know, I knew too much. So my approach was, you know, I got to stop this now and, you know, throw things out and confront and, you know, missing the love piece and the caretaking piece and the connection. Um, so we, we went through many years of, um, uh, it wasn't so good. Um, but you know, now we're at a level, you know, she's still in and out of recovery. Um, but our relationship is so much better and I have more hope, um, you know, as the years go on, she does a little bit better and a little bit better. Um, so anyway, to back to work. So I, I'm now working with youth and adolescents. It seems to be more of a prevention piece right now um, than, you know, sort of a harm reduction, safe space, allowing young people to, you know, talk when they can't talk at home about these issues. I'm kind of like, you know, almost fixing mistakes that I did with my sister, you know, in terms of my job, like learn from, you know, the, the wrong approach. Um, and allowing young people to just, you know, talk about their experiences and um, be very open. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I have a ton more to say, and that was just like I try to fit a lot in a little bit of a section, because, yeah, yeah. Well, 
we will have your contact information or you can put that contact information where people can access uh, you know, your email in the chat if you'd like to continue because all of, you, all of our panelists tonight are so multidimensional and we are so passionate about what we do. You know, even with me, I work at the Addiction Center of Albany as a prevention educator. And I see myself becoming the teacher that I always wanted as a kid, or maybe the, um, uh, not, not family member, because I had those family members, but being that person that, that I wanted as a kid, now I can be that. So the roles have turned. So, you, so you're, it's like life does, all these experiences come back to you in full force to realize it's okay even though you didn't do it before, there's always still time and still growth. You can still do it. It's never done, you know, especially with your family. Thank you for sharing that, Kai. Thanks. Mary, how, how does a addiction impact your work in your personal life, like with your day-to-day? -day? Well, so I actually, and it up. The way I ended up at Catholic Charities as a prevention educator was honestly just by answering an ad mm -hmm. in the one ad. But it appealed to me because as a mother of four to help other children live happy, healthy lives. Is my, can you guys hear me okay? Okay. There's a, there's a little um, lag, but I hear the words. Yeah. The storm is hitting, so my internet's going in and out. Um, yeah, so then once I started working with the youth, I've always worked with youth all throughout my adult life, um, either as a teacher or a youth volunteer or a coach, and as I said, raising my own four children. And um, as I've gotten to know my students in the different school districts, I just built such a connection with them and I wanna see them grow up to be healthy, happy adults. I wanna make sure that they're making healthy choices. Um, and also I wanna add that the people I've met along the way and the colleagues that I'm working with, they've just been amazing. Like I've just learned so much about this entire process, just the whole world, you know, doing this job. Beautiful, and there's never like a coincidence. Right. You're meant yeah. to do what you're doing and to impact these lives in this chapter of your life. Thanks, Mary. Robert, how does addiction affect your uh, personal and your wor work day to day? <clears throat> yeah, so um, my personal experience with addiction um, has been a, it's been a long road. Um, you know, my, I, I had a, I have a father who, who struggles with alcohol and other substances with us when I was a kid. So I was, you know, around it as, as a child. Um, nothing, nothing too severe, thankfully, uh, traumatic had ever happened, but, um, you know, there was, um, you know, my, my idea of like substances and, and the use of alcohol was a little, not that it was not, uh, not unique or anything. I mean, it's a common story, but it was a little, it was a lot of gray area, right? And, um, you know, I'm somebody who's, um, I also am in recovery. Um, and, you know, um, I, I grew up in Columbia County. I was born in Columbia County. Um, you know, so I, I feel a, a deep connection to my community. Um, uh, and, you know, the first time, um, you know, I, I tried to, I tried to get help, um, on my own before and I didn't, and I didn't really know where to turn, um, the first time I did it. Um, I, I had seen my father struggle, you know, he, um, uh, you know, he's a good man, but, you know, went to prison for a DWI, right? You know, uh, I have family members who get, get in trouble here and there, nothing too severe, but, always, always on that edge, you know, um, uh, myself, you know, um, you know, had gotten to a little bit of trouble, you know, with, with the drinking, you know, and, you know, crashed a car anyway. So, um, <clears throat> before I get too off topic, but, you know, I feel, I feel connected with, uh, I know exactly what it feels like for a lot of people with what they're going through. Um, you know, uh, some of the, the clients that we work with, um, uh, you know, they, they help me stay, stay sober, 
you know? Um, and it's, and it's a great feeling to be able to give back and to help um, in a professional capacity. It's, you know, it's something, it's something I probably would be doing, um, you know, if, uh, if somebody had asked me for help, I would be, <laughs> I would uh, as do much, as much as I could to help somebody else. Um, um, and, you know, uh, Kai said it and Tatiana, you said it um, in a professional capacity, like, I wish, you know, maybe if there was a peer available when I ended up in the emergency room as an overdose, um, maybe, maybe I would have got it sooner. Is that true or not? I don't know. But I mean, if there was, if there was somebody there to talk to, somebody there I could have related to, somebody who said, hey man, you know, like, here's my phone number. If, you know, I, I know what it's like, I've been in the same position and, you know, if, um, you know, not all hope is lost. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I, I want that for not only the person I'm working with one-to-one, -one, um, but Tracy had also said, you know, the family support, you know, like if, if, um, if my mother had somebody, if uh, a program or something that was offered to her, um, you know, maybe, maybe she wouldn't have, maybe she would have had more sleep filled nights, <laughs> um, you know? Um, so it's just, um, I'm really, I'm just really glad we're, we're where we're at. I mean, there's, there's still a lot of progress to be made, but you know, there's, there's a lot more people getting on board as to what recovery is and what it means to somebody. Um, uh, and it's becoming, it's becoming, um, the stigma of it, you know, uh, when I tell some people my, some of my stories, you know, not, it's never a war story, but just to, so they get a sense of who I am and where I'm from. Um, you know, they, a lot of the times I get like, uh, you know, get out of here. They're like, wait, you, that was you, you know, like, wait, no, that's, you know, no way you were doing all that stuff. And, you know, not that it, not that it's a brag, but it's a, it's a way to communicate and to, um, you know, build trust and understanding with somebody. And, um, you know, uh, I got into this kind of, uh, I know we've been saying there are no coincidences, but you know, my previous job, my previous employment, I was working at the Columbia Memorial Hospital, um, not as a peer, but I was working there as a patient representative. Um, and, you know, I got, I know people in the recovery community and um, I was, met Carl and, you know, I took the SERPA uh, um, class and then, um, you know, um, the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. And it is true. It's like, you know, a lot of people who are suffering from substance use disorder, it's like they're wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. they're, it's like they're using these um, drugs to suppress something that's happened or something. Mm -hmm. And it's not really them. You know, we have to understand as family members and friends and community members that when we see someone suffering from substance use disorder, we can't judge them by what's like actually on the surface. They're more than that, right? And this is- I agree. That I la mean, layering, taking those layers off. Who are you really? Hmm. You I find mean, that more, recovery. They're more than their diagnosis or, or what you see at surface level. You know, when I talk to clients, um, you know, uh, I always say like when I was active, it was like, I was like watching the world, like through my hands, you know, and like, that was, that was my comfort zone. Just like, you know, just, just not participating. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, here you are now saving lives and helping one another, you know, that's what we need. We can't, when going through these struggles, we can't go alone. We can't do it alone. Now, I have some questions for each of the panelists that were actually from community members. And I'm going to start off with asking Carl Quinn. I'm going to put you on the spot with the first one. <laughs> um, so, Carl, um, the first question for you is, what are some of the benefits you've already seen with harm reduction and your Narcan trainings? You're constantly providing these Narcan trainings in Columbia and Greene County, and I see them all the time on Facebook. And I, I smile every time I see them because it's never... Uh, you know, one, one of them is never enough. It's always important to retake them or help someone. So what are some of the benefits that you've seen by providing these services? Because there's such a, you know, harm reduction, is such a like controversial topic for some people. It, 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 it is, I don't know that it should be, but, but it definitely it is, you know, the science behind harm reduction is that harm reduction saves lives. 
And I think ultimately everybody that's on this panel, everybody that uh, is doing this work in the community, I think that's our end goal at the end of the day. Just save somebody's life uh, enough that, that they get to the point where that light bulb finally goes on to say, maybe today is the day that I get help. And that's, so that's the main premise of what we're trying to do with our harm reduction. A lot of times right now that's, that's Narcan because of the spikes and overdoses. You let off at the, at the beginning of, of the town hall that Columbia County is currently in an overdose spike alert. And, and so what that means for, our, for Columbia County in particular is that we've had more than two overdoses in the last 24 hours in our county. That's the threshold alert. Uh, that OD map, which is our tracking utility, gets set at. So those become important. Once we know where those overdoses are, are occurring, we, we activate our mobile response vehicle. We go out into those communities and then distribute and outreach and give out Narcan. The, the benefit that we're seeing directly to doing that is we're having people come back to us to get Narcan a second and a third time, saying, I used my Narcan to save somebody. I want to make sure I have more. I don't think we can ask for anything more with Narcan than to be able to know it, it's getting in the hands of people that it should be getting into, it's getting used, it's saving lives, and then people are seeing the benefit of it to continue to ask for it to make sure they have it. For We've done some, you know, of course we do numbers tracking all the time because we're a grant funded program, so we report a, a lot about our statistics. Uh, but in the last quarter, we gave out 400 Narcan kits, which is the equivalent of 800 doses of Narcan in the community. Each kit has two doses in it. Uh, that's huge for a county the size of Columbia and Green to have 800 doses of Narcan out in the community. And especially beneficial to know that it's getting used and people are reaching back out uh, to make sure they continue to carry Narcan. So I hope that answers the, the participants question. Yes, thank you so much. Our next question is for Tracy Quinn. Uh, what strategy do you use when handling an individual who's, you know, either in custody, um, you know, who's suffering from mental illness and addiction? Um, I would guess uh, I've that leaves me asking a couple more questions is how they came into our custody. Mm -hmm. um, if there's an underlying criminal aspect to it, that changes my answer. Um, but if we're just dealing with them um, because they have a mental health and you know maybe an addiction element to it, we usually contact mobile crisis and we, if, if at any point we think that they've either mentioned or they are going to be a threat to themselves or someone else, we bring them to CMH for a mental health evaluation. Um, and that usually even overrides a criminal element to it where their mental health and their um, you know, ad addiction issue, mental health being the more prominent one that comes to mind, we, we will address that first and foremost. You know, mm -hmm. We can always give an appearance ticket and follow up with them on the criminal end of it, um, but mostly we wanna make sure that they're not gonna hurt themselves or someone else. You know that's that's our key concern mm -hmm. if we're dealing with them for that but um yeah that's that's most likely what we would do if we encounter them and that's the reason for the call so it's not just seeing the criminal as a criminal but seeing them as an individual as to why are they doing the things that they do you know how can Absolutely. we outreach to uh local providers to help assist you is what you're, what is um what you do? we really yeah, I mean, we really do that often. I, I think the public doesn't really see how much we do that. Um, we call mobile crisis or their mental health worker. We have a really good working relationship with um, the mental health community in Greene County, where we know if they're either under care of someone or they mention they're under care of someone, there's a good chance that we can either contact that person immediately or you know, the next day and we follow up on it. We get them the care that they need. We make sure that there's, they're not falling through the cracks that their mental health is being tended to. Um, all of my guys do a really good job and girls do a really good job at that. Um, we, you know, and mobile crisis helps us a lot by coming to the scene. If, if they're needed, they, they come immediately. So, you know, I, I think it's 
if people really saw how we operated out on the road, they'd be really reassured with the fact that we all work really well together and that someone's mental health is paramount to making an arrest for something. It's really important. Um, and so when, um, oh, I just had another question. Oh, um, what's your relationship with a uh, drug court? Um, I guess, I mean, I know who they are. We don't really work too closely with them because that's after like the sentencing phase. Mm -hmm. So that would be after, you know, after our, we deal with them and, you know, have done our, our dealings with the DA's office and stuff. That's more something that the DA's office would handle. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't, unless somebody's got like a personal relationship with them, I, I guess it could be better because we don't really deal with drug court that much unless somebody violates Interesting. Thank you so much for that. It it yeah. is that's why I wanted that was my goal with asking that question too, was shining this light so the community can see, because the community sees only what they see in their day to day. But they don't step into your shoes and see what you see or what you know Kai sees or Quinn or uh, Carl or uh, Mary. You know, like and and Robert like right. seeing you guys in action, and and that's what's so yeah. Key. We don't. Mm -hmm. We don't want to just charge someone to charge someone. I mean, we have to have like a culpability factor. So we have to at least be able to say that we feel comfortable that they were doing it with like a knowledge and an intent and, you know, the wherewithal to be doing what they're doing. So if there's going to be a strong um, feeling or, you know, element to the case, that's going to be like a mental health factor. Obviously, we still, you know, some people need to answer and have consequences for their actions, but we definitely weigh um, the culpability factor when we're, when we're doing our job. Great. Thank you so much for that information. Yep. Uh, Kai, my question for you is working with youth and families that are struggling, um, either with substance use disorder or other, um, struggles in the community. How can you help, um, you know, that youth and family when you see something, when you see like a warning sign that the child is presenting? Yeah, so I think, I think mostly we, it's about relationships and trust. Um, I mean, that's first and foremost. So throughout the years, the clubhouse has existed in Columbia and Greene County for three years now. Um, and through that process, you know, we've built a lot of trusting relationships with the youth and some with the families. Um, that's, that's where the, the, the conversations, we can be open, we can talk about it, we can process, and still not telling people what to do. We allow for that self-determination, that person-centered approach of like meeting them where they're at, all of those um, factors, um, and really processing with them what's, what's the best decision for them. Um, you know, a lot of times what we see is the young people that are feeling or leaning more towards the side of more use, um, substance use, uh, they tend to come around a little bit less, um, but they always know they have a safe space and they always come back so that we can have those conversations. But thankfully, like, you know, we're at that prevention level um, where, you know, and Greener Pathways is out there doing, um, you know, that on the ground work that's also so necessary. They're interacting with people young and old that are actually more, um, you know, asking for Narcan or asking for supplies um, to be safer. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot, but it, it, it comes to just being, you know, the relationships are the most important. Yeah, how could you provide that service and support if they're just a number to you, right? You want to, they want to be seen and heard, not just be talked at. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why a lot of times they come to us and talk about subjects that they're not going to be able to talk to at home. And you know, to talk about at home because, you know, like, like my experience, I, you know, if my sister came to me and wanted to talk to me about drugs, I'd be like, no, <laughs> you can't, you know, well, back then. 
before I knew what I knew now. Yeah, and like talking to someone neutral, kind of like it's not so, it's like a clean slate. Because I'm with family, it's like, what? What do you mean? Ugh. And it's like, no, I just want to ask a question. Yeah. So yeah, so you are a safe person in the community that they can connect with to ask those questions about, well, what happens? Or what is it, what is it like? Like, and then giving your experience, you know, what the struggles that you've gone through, it's like, this is not, I'm not just kidding. Like, this isn't, I'm not just telling you don't do it because I want to control you. This is really like, hurts people and hurts all the people around you. I also just want to add a lot of our discussions, you know, that we let the youth lead and we have a lot of serious discussions. And, um, you know, a lot of their recovery is not around alcohol and substance abuse. You know, we have traumas, um, you know, and, and especially right now, I have to bring up like racialized trauma and you know systemic racism and those things like that are very very real to our young people to everybody but like they're talking about it depression anxiety like all of these things and we make it an open space to talk about those things um i i think and i see it's hard to take statistics when we don't we don't document things right we're not we're not treatment center and things like that but through these three years, we see the impact in people's lives just by like anecdotally. Just providing that safe place that you know you are trauma informed, you're providing these services that can care for them and it's a safe space for them to, you know, because it's, it's really hard for people to talk about race and to talk about experiences and to not be judged. Thank you so much. Thank you. People need, <laughs> we need more people like you. Mary, I have a question for you. How important is teaching self-esteem to children in relation to addiction and drug use? Um, yeah, building positive self-esteem is one of our big lessons that we teach at all grade levels. Um, yeah, having a good sense of yourself and realizing that you're important and that you're body is important, that's important for children to have in order to stay substance free, um, important their brain and their body is, and that, you know, don't you want to grow up to be the best you you can possibly be? Because if so, you need to believe in yourself, you need to set goals for yourself, you need to make good decisions, um, and make healthy friendships. We talk about, um, having friends that build you up instead of tear you down um, because you, you need to feel good about yourself too. That's really important. There was a quote um, or I, I heard it on a podcast um, that it's better, you feel better when you're nobly alone than being with low company. Yeah. So believing in yourself, trusting that you have everything that you need within you. You don't need that external validation to complete you. In right. the society, it's so hard for kids to grasp that. Yeah, and, and it gets really tricky when they get to be about middle school age and maybe it's the friends start changing and trying to teach young people that it's okay to make new friends, it's okay to change your circle of friends. You know, you can still help the friends that you are friends with. Maybe they're making bad decisions. You don't abandon mm -hmm. them, but you do have to, to make healthy choices. And there was another question as well in regards to talking about drug use and talking about, you know, just in general, like what it is, what does it do? Um, some parents might say that talking about it is going to make the children more curious and want to experiment more. Um, me being a prevention educator too, I see that question. I'm like, no way. The more you talk about it, the better it is. So what's your opinion and how can you relate that information to parents and families in the community? I am a firm believer that the younger you start, the better, and then continue the message over the course of years. Yes, if I, if I walked into a high school today and 
did one of my prevention lessons to a group of stu students I've never met before, I might walk away thinking, what, what did I, you know, are they gonna go home and think, ooh, I wanna try what she was talking about. But by starting in kindergarten and building year after year after year, all of our lessons about, about positive self-esteem, about decision-making, goal setting, peer pressure refusal strategies, the importance of protecting your brain and your body, then by the time they are seventh, eighth, ninth grade, um, like for example, I go into seventh grade and when I start talking about alcohol, they say, wait, you usually talk to us about making friends and making, setting goals and making good decisions. And then I say, yeah, do you see how they're connected? Because they are connected. So we don't go in and say to a kindergartner, for example, this is alcohol, this is what it does, you know, we're just building the whole person basically. So it's never too young to start the prevention message. Beautifully said. I <laughs> back you 100%. <laughs> now, Robert, I have a question for you. So as a person in recovery of substance use disorder, um, so what does like peer work actually look like? And, um, you know, how can families, especially with COVID and what's going on, like how can they access um, support with that one-on-one -on -one connection with you? Uh, yeah, so if, if the question is, what does a typical day look like? Well, you can, you know, you can kind of throw that out the window. Um, uh, you know, if, uh, so like peer work, um, you know, we will, we'll engage, we'll have, it's voluntary, it's voluntary, right? So the, 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 the recovery, or we call them clients here, um, you know, it's, it's voluntary. So they, you know, we, we will engage with them, um, kind of through the spectrum of the recovery journey. You know, sometimes we meet people when they're having um, uh, like the worst day of their life, maybe, you know, we might get a referral from the hospital. Um, uh, you know, somebody was found unresponsive or they're in withdrawal and they need immediate help, right? And, um, you know, in that example, uh, if they agree to talk to a peer, um, you know, we'll, we'll engage them in the hospital. Um, we have a good relationship up there in the emergency room, um, you know, myself, I'll, I'll, I'll go in and introduce myself, um, try to, you know, kind of assess where they're at, you know, because um, I'm not going to throw a bunch of information at them or kind of talk loud or, you know, um, you know, I, it's like that kind of like the, the art part of like connecting with people, right? You know, so, uh, um, you know, they'll give you more information without me without me having to draw it out of them you know? so i'll help we can help uh, a client through that situation maybe get them connected if if it's if it's a good day you know um i can call a facility and i can um depending on the emergency room and the situation um if it's not a bed to bed transfer um you know we can get them discharged as long as they're medically cleared and we will drive them to um uh, a detox or rehab that uh, has a, a bed available. Uh, other times we can set them up with <clears throat> um, MAT if that's something they, you know, so I'll go in and list what we could do, what services can be provided, what options there are, and we kind of build a sort of plan, um, um, you know, uh, to, to reach that goal, right? Um, other times we we can engage with somebody where we get a referral or sometimes they're self-referred who maybe just needs somebody to talk to who can relate and they just need to vent, you know? Um, uh, there's, there's times, um, you know, uh, there'll be clients who could be, you know, being housed by uh, social services, you know, who um, have to do a, so like the telehealth and telemedicine had obviously for, everybody uh, has, has been a, a learning curve for us, you know. Um, but one of the things we can do with people who have, um, and, and Captain Quinn can relate to this, no internet service or they don't have data on their phone and but they're um, required to have their DSS housing and their funding and, and benefits to, um, you know, go complete outpatient treatment uh, or they got to be connected with their, um, uh, MAT services, um, you know, but they don't have, they don't have the equipment to do that. You know, we've been able to, 
Uh, I've gone to clients' homes, um, set up, brought my laptop, and this is like the beauty of us being mobile and being able to meet people where they're at, you know? Um, and it's all, like I said, it's all volunteer based, so they're not mandated. So it, it becomes this, it's as a peer, the definition of peer is like we're on equal footing, right? Like I'm not, I'm not here to tell you what you got to do. Um, you know, I'm not telling you that's wrong. Um, sometimes you have to be a truth teller, but it, you know, it, it depends on, uh, you know, it's a case by case thing. Um, uh, you know, so, so they feel, um, more comfortable, you know, um, sometimes it's helping people get to court appearances so they can get their license back so they can get a job. Um, you know, sometimes people need some help with, um, getting to a doctor's appointment, even though Medicab will pay for it, but they, they need that support. They don't want to feel alone, you know? Um, um, so, I mean, I'd like to think as a peer and, uh, Twin Counties and Greater Pathway, uh, you know, what we can do and the beauty of it is we're kind of, we're kind of, we're kind of like, I don't, <laughs> Not to, not to gloat or anything, but I, I feel like we're kind of like the glue or the mortar and all this and these bricks of agencies and things that are provided to people who are in need of social support, positive, um, uh, positive, uh, healthy coping mechanisms and somebody to talk to or they more traditional stuff of like getting literal things done as far as like doctor's appointments and, and setting them up between counties and have them do uh, an assessment with family planning, say, you know? Um, uh, so every day, if, if it's a perfect day, we'll have a full schedule. I'll come into the office, um, you know, uh, I'll see what's on my, my Outlook calendar. I'll meet with clients and, uh, you know, it's a good day. Other days you come in and there's three referrals uh, from different places and what you had going on is, you know, you gotta kind of triage and prioritize sometimes, you know, but we, we make it work. Um, uh, who, who's in, who's in like crisis and who's in need and, you know, uh, we'll be in contact with mental, uh, mobile crisis. Um, uh, so I, I hope I, I kind of went on a rant there, but I, I think I answered the question. What does it look like? <laughs> no, that's great. It's, it the more like? you, the more you say the better because it clicks for certain people that need to hear it. So the more yeah. you say the better. Right. Now, I want to open up the dialogue with people that are watching live, either on Facebook or on um, Zoom right now. What are your questions after hearing what's actually, what services are provided to you on the prevention, treatment, and recovery spectrum of substance use disorder and addictions? Um, I know being like, my parents used to own Tatiana's Restaurant in Catskill, and my family used to own Anthony's, and they still own Anthony's Banquet Hall. And I've surround, I've always been, my whole life, I've always been surrounded by alcohol and drug use, whether, you know, obviously like cigarettes, I mean. Um, so it's like, I knew at a really early age, I never, ever touch it. Like it's something that, you know, adults do, don't ever touch it. So I was always used to that. But as a kid, like seeing like the differences of people when they were like, drinking alcohol and then they weren't, that was like really baffling to me. And I thought of it as more comical and funny. But really, as I'm getting older and now I'm in this field, I'm like, wow, they're suffering. So I don't see someone as, look at that idiot, look at what they're doing, ugh. They're making such a terrible name for themselves. I see them as, oh my gosh, what, what happened to you? What, what do you need? So I hope that other people can see that too when they see someone struggling or hear about a family member or friend struggling. Not only like, oh, oh, well, well, or oh, well, yeah, my cousin's like that or my uncle's like that. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That person's a, hum a person and they're struggling and they, they're, the easiest strategy, coping strategy for them and coping skill for them is to pick up a drink or to smoke or do these things. So community like what do you like what are your questions or what are your insights in regards to this uh beautiful wonderful panelists that we have here that are full of resources and information any questions you can unmute yourself um and i know that daniel hoteling is managing the uh, live uh, on facebook um so feel free to unmute yourself and chime in
Hi, this is John. Hi, this is Jonathan. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks. It's a terrific panel. Hey, Kai, um, I'm really never even considered it and uh, really interested in your comment about um, systemic racism and how it's affecting the people you're working with and um, and how that might affect issues around substance use as well. Are you seeing a spike in that, you know, because, you know, that this is a panel about substance use. And yet, meanwhile, you brought that up and it seems so obviously connected. So I'm really curious as to what you've observed. Yeah, so thanks, Jonathan. Um, in real time, you know, what I'm observing is young people that are definitely struggling mental health wise um, regarding the, the, the traumas that are, you know, the, the topics that are just like going on or like highlighted right now. Basically, we all know that, you know, well, some of us don't know, but most of us know systemic racism is a real and it's a thing and it's in our country. And, you know, our young people, our old people have all been affected um, by it. And, and so right now our young people are like, well, this is nothing new. It's just new that it's in our face, the media, media, media. So it's like re-traumatizing almost. Um, it's, it's so much, I don't know what to say, but the rates of depression and anxiety, and it's probably a combination of both having this out in the media as well as COVID and being isolated, you know, that's a recipe for, you know, for us with addiction tendencies to, you know, um, use and abuse or not know how to cope. I mean, it's statistically, I know, you know, I don't know current statistics, but I know in the past, like, you know, Native Americans have a higher rate of alcoholism. LGBTQ young people have a higher rate of addiction. You know, th so there's these themes and we only naturally, it makes sense that, you know, that is going on right now. But again, I don't take data from the clubhouse. Um, so I can't call on statistics for that. But anecdotally, you see the the mental health depression and, um, you know, even if it's just using marijuana as a coping mechanism for their anxiety. Um, yeah, I, I could, I could see that increasing, you know, I could see that's happening right now. I don't know if that answered your question. Yes. Thank you. That's great. If I could, could add to that a little bit with, with some of the experiences that we're seeing, you know, Columbia and Greens, look, we, we all know as providers, we're in a very rural community. And so our communities tend to be less people of color and more people who, who are white, like us. And I think there's an opportunity for us as providers and as teams working across the counties to say, we hear you, we see you, to the people of color in the community who don't necessarily see us as a resource because we don't look like them. And I think that turns people away from some of the time trying to seek out options because there is that disparity between the community that we serve and, and the folks that are in the provider network. And you know, I think that's an opportunity for us as, to, as providers to say, we can be better, we can do better. We have to have the contact, we have to find out ways to engage that population with the services that Columbia and Greene County and many other rural counties across the state provide who, who are very similar to, to what we're here in Columbia and Greene. Just a, my thought to add on to that. Yes, thank you, Carl. Absolutely. Yep. And there's, yeah, there's a distrust in systems. When you're, you know, black and brown, you, there's just an inherent distrust in our systems of, I'm not going to the police with that thing, or I'm not going to the doctor or the counselor for that thing because, you know, they're going to turn around and, you know, CPS and, you know, it's a system of consequences, you know, or jail time, disproportionate numbers in jail, like 
all of that is very, very real to people. And we as white people tend sometimes it just like goes over our head because we don't have to um, think like that. Our privilege, we don't have to even consider that that's the thing. So yeah, there's so much, you know, in this topic that could go on, but I'll stop. Exactly. And just educating yourself, like no one is an expert. We are forever evolving and learning new things and adapting to new ideologies and technology and new perspectives and insights and being open-minded to the community as a whole. Because, you know, growing up in Catskill, like I did have a diverse group of people that I hung out with and I, that I went to school with. And it was a beautiful thing, but you cannot like you, we need to educate ourselves as to what can we do as allies? What can we do as providers on the whole spectrum? Because it's also the culture of it too. Think about, you know, the people of color or like immigrants coming in. There's like, they don't talk about uh, mental health. They don't talk about mental illness. They don't talk about addiction. They don't talk about that, but they're quick to talk about, oh yeah, my heart, oh, my asthma. Oh, this and that, my knee, my hip. So it's extremely important to have these conversations to end the stigma of all of that so we can provide these services to everyone. And um, anyone else would like to share? Please go ahead. Hi, Tatiana, it's Jen. Hey. Oasis Partners, thank you for all that you do. And you know, personally, I thank all of you, you know, from my heart and everything that you give. And I, I want to remind everybody about self-care and just make sure that you're say, taking care of yourself at the same time. Thank you. So Erin here from uh, Reentry, Columbia. Um, hi, everybody. I am um, wondering if anybody is, um, what kind of conversations we're having around funding and potentially the impact COVID is going to have on our funding and the need for really kind of stepping back and developing informal networks to continue the work, potentially continuing the work that we're doing with not as many individuals out there on the front lines, but the problems are real, you know, not going away. And, you know, what, what, what are people's thoughts? That's an extremely important question. I can, I can jump in on, on that one a little bit with the Greener Pathways program because we're we are a grant funded program, uh, federal money from SAMHSA that gets uh, given to New York State at Oasis and then Oasis uh, spreads that money out across the state based on, on some metric data, actual live data, uh, you know, that reinforces the need. Uh, so we, within the last week or so, we've started having some really positive conversations with Oasis uh, about what the next iteration of the Greener Pathways program looks like uh, after our current grant cycle ends in, in September. So there, there are conversations right now occurring about continuing the program. And, and it will, you know, I, I think to your point, Aaron, I think we're all going to see less funding across the board, you know, as things, you know, start to work. And I think it's up to us as, as providers and community members to say, how are we gonna find out new and innovative ways to do things for less money? I think it's ultimately what it comes down to. And I, you know, I think we have a great group of providers on this group. We have a great group of providers in our Colombian Green community who will put their heads together and figure out what that looks like so that we can continue to serve the population that, that we're, we're targeted with. Uh, you know, the people who need us most. Um, so uh, to definitely affect some COVID, um, I'm sure a lot of the funding, you know, that went to organizations like ours and yours is, is going to be impacted as some of the COVID money is, is rerouted uh, from the federal government and also the, the state and local government. It, it's a huge issue, issue to tackle. And I, I don't know where it will lay, but, I, but I'm encouraged that there are conversations that are at least happening uh, at the state and local level about what that looks like for us. Thanks, Carl. 
Any other questions? Hey, Tatiana. Yes. It's Tracy. It's Tracy. Um, I would just like to jump in before we're done um, and mention, uh, I think Jonathan Gross might be on. I'm, I can't see who's on on the Zoom, but yes. um, we just had a meeting with him um, quickly because this, the focus of this is, you know, to let people know what is out there in our community. Um, and the Mountaintop Cares Coalition is um, in the infancy of starting a recovery center that's basically just focusing on the mountaintop at this point, but I'm sure they would help whoever is in need. Um, and if he's on, he can probably add a little bit more to that, but um, we just had our initial meeting last week just to learn what we can do to partner together and help each other. Um, obviously this would be a big help for us with uh, the people that are in our ICP program that we um, offer services to and would be like a follow-up care. And it's basically gonna be a place that offers um, counseling and family counseling and meetings and um, uh, is Jonathan on that he would be able yes. to add more to it I know I'm giving like a very brief description but it's it's really his baby and it is a really mm -hmm. good thing coming to the, the mountaintop and probably would benefit um, for something in the valley that um, you know mimics what they're doing in the future should we be as successful as we hope to be. That's ex extremely important. Yes, Tracy, Jonathan is on, and the uh, Mountaintop Cares Coalition has just recently became a 501c3 and is doing amazing things for Tannersville, Hunter, Wyndham, and all of the uh, mountaintop, uh, hilltop towns, I guess, um, up there. So Jonathan, would you like to share a little bit more about your services and your plans? Yeah, well, very briefly, we are, I, I guess what I can add is that we are strictly grassroots and if there's a, you know, if there's a message in that, it's that, um, you know, our primary focus has always been to try to enhance and work with the agencies. I mean, what do we know? We're really a bunch of volunteers, though we're attracting more, more professionals and people in the, in the business, so to speak. But we're learning how to kind of access um, private donations and access local talent so that you know, we can open this center and then once we do, and that's the meeting Tracy was talking about, once we open the center and we fund it, it looks like we're going to be able to do that. And we have some office space. We can then invite the agencies that are already doing the work. Um, you know, Paula was my first contact, hi Paula, uh, years ago. And so, um, uh, and we also are trying to reach out to other grassroots organizations uh, so that we can begin to network with them in the same way. Um, so really, um, I do want to, so thank you for that. It's great that you came. We're very, very young. We're constantly learning. Uh, we have the same problem everybody does, which is how do you enlist volunteers and keep staffed up, um, and still offer the services that you do. Uh, but we have a robust recruiting plan and we're kind of noisy. I do want to just mention one thing though. So anyway, thank you. It's been great. We have so much to learn from everybody here. Uh, and I kid you not about that. So we're having a town meeting to, on Thursday night. Uh, we um, we have a place. We've rented it. We're we're getting open. We're going to open on September first. Uh, and we did not need to have a town meeting because uh, we don't need approval. Uh, we are there is no zoning in Wyndham, but all of a sudden there's a lot of pushback. There are now petitions. Uh, there's going to be a meeting which I've agreed to go to just because I thought it would be good to be transparent and to invite the town to come and hear what we have to say and who we are. And in the, what's now happening is kind of this movement in town to try to stop us. So this will be an interesting meeting on Thursday. I'm actually kind of glad it's happening. I'm nervous as hell, but uh, uh, I do invite uh, Tracy. I don't know whether um, uh, Pete spoke with you or not, but we're hoping to have as many people there to show that we have uh, a lot of support in the community, both in the mountaintop community and around. So uh, it's not without a few bumps and bruises, but we're committed and I believe that once we open, people will understand what we're doing and that we're really there to, uh, to, you know, to help people. We are not the problem we're trying to solve. So you, anyway. are doing, you guys are doing amazing work. I've been to multiple meetings and multiple events there, traveling from Albany to your events. And how amazing, what a great turnout. All of the 
events and meetings to get the input, to know what the community's needs are. You're doing good things. You're trying to save lives. So there's, you know, there might be pushbacks, but you're going to be good. Everything's going to, I'm, I'm, you honestly, you all, you, you have all your ducks in a row. You have everything ready. So you're doing good work. You're helping people. That's the whole intention of it. And if anyone doesn't align with that intention, then they can back off. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll let them know that on Thursday. But thank you. <laughs> or I'll come and let them know. So a little bit more about your meeting. Is it streamed or how can, like, what's, when is the meeting, what time, or how can people attend the meeting to support um, you? It's seven o'clock in Hansonville, which is the town hall for Wyndham, uh, interestingly enough. And it's at seven o'clock. Uh, it's, um, it's all, um, um, you know, uh, CDC, uh, COVID uh, for New York State uh, protocols. So I guess the good news is that I'll be inside with a few people talking and they can only let two or three people in at a time, which is better than a couple of hundred angry, <laughs> you know, town members. I, who knows if that's the case. So, uh, but we are looking for people to show up seven o'clock Thursday night, Hensonville, even if it's just hanging out outside and maybe talking to some of the people who are objecting. We want to be transparent. We really want to be civilized and inviting. We are a welcome center after. So show up if you can. Thank you, Jonathan. And so that's Jonathan Gross from uh, Mountaintop Cares Coalition. You can look them up on Facebook. And I do want to highlight, sorry to put you on the spot, Lori, but from uh, Columbia County Pathways to Recovery, you guys are doing amazing, beautiful things. And I want to spotlight you as to, you know, what you're doing with your uh, recovery center. What do you, like, so what are your plans? And, and this, that's why I love these town hall meetings so much so we can learn from one another and we can shine a light on what's actually happening. Hi guys, uh, I was joining by phone and I've just joined by computer. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So yeah, I'm um, so happy to see everybody in this meeting, so great. Um, we are really thrilled that we leased a spot in Hudson for a physical location for a um, recovery community outreach center. I was so excited to hear Jonathan talk about the same thing. So this has been a goal of ours at CCPR for about four years and we're so excited that we found a spot. We leased it about a week before everything shut down for COVID. So we haven't gotten up and running completely yet. Uh, we had a soft opening last weekend and it went really well. We just did some very limited numbers of people, you know, in the building at, at one time. And we did some tours and gave information about what programs we'll be offering. So we're trying to get that off the ground in a way where we can kind of decide how we can make it work with the restrictions that we have right now in place with COVID. And I think, you know, we'll start with some small meetings for at the moment, um, we have a list of programs that we would like to offer and we're sort of reaching out to people and seeing who we can kind of get on board to sort of help us with this. So uh, like, like Jonathan was talking about, we'll be doing um, mutual support groups, you know, AA and a uh, refuge recovery, smart meetings, all those kinds of things, as well as Narnons, Al-Anons. Um, we'd like to do morning coffee drop-ins. We're going to do, we're doing online now, uh, trauma-informed yoga classes and meditation classes, which we will move to our center when we can actually get enough people in there um, in terms of restrictions. Um, yeah, so we're, we're just, we're gonna offer, offer as many non-clinical services as we can and really be a safe, non-judgmental place for people to come, congregate, um, you know, just support each other and and be able to get help from the from their peers, from the community, from each other, and just um, yeah, be able to do. Sorry, be able to do um, uh, some things that aren't already offered in our county. And we really we feel like we really need this kind of an outlet for people. We we're hoping to do some mindfulness things and some um, some things that aren't easy to find elsewhere, you know, some movie nights, poetry slams, journaling classes, um, as well, and a lot of self-care things, as well as um, the sort of life skill things like housing help, budgeting help, 
um, you know, um, KSEC training, SERPA training, we're, we're hoping to offer some scholarships for that if we get funding. So we're hoping to really be a community center and an outreach place for people to come for support, for information, to get linked up to services. And, um, and we're so excited that we're hoping we're gonna be able to, to do some things quickly there. We also have a helpline that now reaches into Greene County, along with Jonathan and his, his RCO as well at Mountaintop. So that will, um, that'll continue to work. We're, you know, we do that all not from a central location. So that's gonna continue as it is. And, and that is basically a, a seven day a week, uh, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. It's run by volunteers and we help get people into detoxes and rehabs as well as just be a recovery or a resource rather for people who want information or people who need to get linked up to services. And we arrange for transportation to people, for people who need to be taken to and from detox and rehab. So that number in case people don't know it is 877 hope 365 h-o-p-e 365 so yeah thanks for giving me a minute to talk i'm glad i I'm glad i got on this from my phone to my computer and didn't lose you all <laughs> thank you Lori, so much for that it's extremely helpful and i did put that information in the chat along Great. with um all of the other facebook pages and uh websites that you can access these resources so you can like copy and paste them or go to them now um, I put in um, the link for this event so you can read more about the bios of the panelists that we had today and then I also put the panelists uh, the organization's Facebook pages on the chat as well um, as well as the number that Lori just gave us um, the Facebook page for Mountaintop Cares Coalition um, the Addictions Care Center of Albany's website, since the Family Support Navigator, we kind of like work together with other organizations to um, help one another, especially through Northeastern Community Action Partnership. And then I also put my own nonprofit on there, which is Noteworthy Resources, and that's at um, nwralbany.org. So I provide a variety of networking, educational and empowering workshops and support groups for you know, the capital region. And since I'm from Catskill, I host a lot of them there as well. So just providing all these insights, connecting to one another, asking these questions and collaboration, like partnerships are key. Like not one person creates a community, we all do. So we need to start asking more questions, knowing what's available to us um, and don't feed that stigma of, oh, it's okay. Like uh, they don't wanna talk about it. Like it's the more you talk about things, the better it is to serve someone else and i want to open up to the panelists just the last couple minutes that we have is how can uh, viewers um, reach you um, what information can you give um, to the our audience today as to how to access your um, services so carl quinn how can um, individuals access your resources where could they go or who, who, what can right. what phone number uh, so we have a couple couple of different ways because we, uh, you know, as Bob highlighted before, sometimes we work with people who might not have cell phones or they might not have minutes. They may be on a on a Wi-Fi connection. So we tried and identified some of those gaps in ways that people might might reach out to us. So first of all, phone. Our our office number here is 518-291-4500. Uh, that'll give you a menu choice of getting directly to either the peer advocate, our transportation coordinator, Daniel Ward, who does our transportation throughout Columbia and Greene County, uh, or you know, ways to connect with our program. Our website is www.greenerpathways.org. Uh, has a whole list of services. There's an, a nice about us section that has pictures of all of our program staff. Again, some against their better judgment that they didn't want on the website, but you know, you kind of got to do what the director says sometimes. And um, so those are those are up there for people to see. Uh, you, so you actually get to see who it is you're going to be talking to or working with uh, is the premise with that. We also have a, a special section on our website that deals with some of the changes that occurred because of COVID-19. So there are additional resources up there uh, about how to reach out to 
other organizations, the impact of COVID-19 on some things, uh, as well as ways to access online meetings, harm reduction supplies through the mail, and uh, some really great resources off the website. We have a very active Facebook page and Instagram account, so you can follow us on Facebook at Greener Pathways, uh, and the same thing our, on our Instagram account. We try and, and, and post updated relevant information. Uh, spike alerts, as soon as those occur, we, you know, we get those up on our, on our Facebook page and get those released out. Uh, one of the other ways that we have the option of keeping in touch about spike alerts is through our text to Narcan program. So anybody that needs Narcan can send the word Narcan kit to the number 21,000. It's all one word, Narcan kit, to the number 21,000. That immediately goes to one of our peer advocates who will respond with either fentanyl test strips or Narcan if those are needed. But then you can opt into the database so that we can then notify you when spike alerts occur. And, and you have a choice of selecting whether you want to be notified for Columbia County, Greene County, or both counties if an overdose alert should occur. Uh, so that it's just another tool for us to be able to stay in touch with our population uh, and the community in general to, to be able to reach out when needed. Uh, the last thing about our Facebook page is that over the last couple of weeks, we have now instituted a book a peer appointment directly through our Facebook page. So you can go to the Facebook uh, appointment section on our Facebook page and request a peer appointment anytime between 10 and 3, Monday through Friday. Uh, and so usually we're requesting a day out. So if you were to go on our Facebook page today, you could be able to request a meeting tomorrow and, and then vice versa, you know, to, to go a day out just so that we have time to schedule it. Uh, so just another resource that we think might hit the targeted population we're, we're trying to reach. Uh, if they don't want to pick up a phone and they're comfortable on their on their Facebook, just send us that message or connect with us on Facebook and we can make that happen too. Thank you, Carl. Anything you'd like to add, Robert? Your like um, phone number or email? Uh, yeah, Carl. Carl did great. He 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 knows all the contact information. Uh, but to reach me personally, it, it would uh, through my work email would be Robert H at Twin Counties Recovery Services. Dot org. I know it's a mouthful, but um, uh, also uh, with the office number, the 518-291-4500. Um, uh, it's a prompt uh, on option three, but you can listen through all the, the selected ones. Uh, and that goes right to my voicemail. Uh, my work cell phone is 518-822-7094. Uh, call or text, uh, that's fine with me. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, that's Carl. Carl got all the big, the big hits, and that those are uh, how you can reach me. Thank you, Kai. How can people reach you? Hey, yeah. So um, I guess first off, I'll I'll give out my phone number. Uh, reach me directly is uh, the work cell phone is five one eight five six seven 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 one. Um, my email is K Hillman, H I, sorry, I got the dog with the squeaky toy. Okay. Let me start that over. Uh, K Hillman at M H A C G dot O R G. Um, there's two L's and two N's in my last name. A lot of people miss that. So, um, and we also have our websites through M H A, um, C G dot O R G. That's our main website. However, um, we as Clubhouse mostly use Facebook, Instagram, and yes, we made a TikTok. E. <laughs> um, but yeah, people can message us through those. Um, like Carl said, like a lot of people don't have access to phones, but they figure out access to internet. Um, things like that. It's it's not a problem. Any any one of those uh, ways. Our handle, I think that's what it's called. Yes, I'm older than I look. Um, is at C2 Clubhouse. Um, so that's how. That's across the board. Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Um, Youth Clubhouse is a Colombian Green County. Um, you can find us and call, text. You text my number. Um, anytime. If I'm sleeping, I'll get to it in the morning. <laughs> Thank you, Kai, so much. Right. And Mary, 
How can people reach you? Uh, you can go to the Catholic Charities website, which is catholiccharitiescg.org, or they can call the office, and the number is 518-828-8660. And they could just ask for Mary or Kelly for the prevention program. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And Captain Tracy, how can people, um, besides 911, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, how can people <laughs> yeah, don't reach do you? That. <laughs> no. Um, I have my desk phone is 518-943-3300, uh, extension 8009. If I'm not there, you can leave a message. I kind of buzz around all the time. Uh, my email is great. Uh, T Quinn, T for Tracy, Q-U-I-N-N at discovergreen.com. And it's G-R-E-E-N-E, -E, like the county. Um, and the ICP program uh, for those who would like to contact that or want to get um, some insight into the services or what they do. Uh, the phone number for that is 518-821-8778. And that is to investigator George Tortorellis. And we have an email for that as well. Green County ICP. Again, G-R-E-E-N-E -E, County ICP at gmail.com. Awesome. Okay, everyone. And you can reach me, Tatiana Georgi. I'm sorry, I'm like trying not to smile because my like stitches from my wisdom tooth, it's terrible. <laughs> um, but um, you can reach me with any more questions if you forget or didn't write down any information today. If you have any questions about today's um, virtual town hall meeting, you can reach me at, um, I'm just going to put on the chat, but it's T Georgi at theacca.net. I do, um, um, I do, um, what is it? Uh, I do, I'm very active on the NECAPS Facebook page and the Addiction and Care Center of Albany's prevention page. And this is also the handle for, um, oh, I spelled it wrong, Northeastern CAP is the Instagram, so we're very active on there just to provide resources for all walks of life, whether it is Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. And um, my phone number is 518-465-5829, extension um, 413. And I can give you any information in regards to any of our partners, whether in Columbia, Green County, Albany, Schenectady, Rensselaer, Saratoga, Warren, Washington, whatever, especially our family support navigators that they can provide support for you too, or they help families as well and help everyone. So it's extremely important to, you know, virtually have each other's hands, connect with one another. And I hope that this panel discussion is educational and resourceful for you. And you can walk away tonight um, you know, with a little bit more information and support for your community. So thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much to the panelists for being here. Kind of lets everyone clap for them. You did amazing. Thank you so much for being available. And I look forward to um, seeing you all soon. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.